So this unit, uh, we're going to talk about death and dying and the grieving process. This is um, the focus of the work that I did in graduate school. Um, I studied counseling psychology with a focus on writing as a healing tool and working with um, the dying and the grieving. And um, like a lot of things in life, this um, came about quite by accident for me. Um, this is me and my dad in um, about 1969. And he had a really uh, massive heart attack in 1976 when he was only 36. And um, he was essentially um, an invalid from that point forward. And he died in 1987 um, when I was just kind of moving out of the house and getting ready to go to college. So um, his death um, really impacted me um, in lots of different ways, um, some of them positively, some of them not so positively, the positive parts I didn't see for many, many, many years. Um, but one of those positive parts was that it gave me an increased empathy and an increased understanding of um, uh, the griever and the dying process that I don't think I would have come to um, at such a young age. And it in many ways sort of set in motion a lot of the work of my life. So I think it's really important to um, talk about death and dying at least for a little bit in a Psych 101 class. Um, if for no other reason, then it's not then it's something that we never seem to talk about. Yet it is something that every single person is going to experience. Um, we're going to experience the deaths of those we love. We're going to experience the deaths of our pets. Um, and at some point, uh, we're going to experience death ourselves. And so um, this sort of uh, societal silence around the grieving process and around death um, is really quite harmful um, and it doesn't allow us the space to communicate openly and honestly um, about something that is is part of the natural life cycle. Death is not something that is unnatural. There are ways of dying that are unnatural. There are ways of dying that you know are not um, you know, we think about, you know, we were born, we live, we die when we're, you know, when we're old, but this is not something that's guaranteed by any stretch. People are murdered, people die in car accidents, people overdose, people, um, young people get, um, you know, uh, terminal illnesses, um, people die in house fires, you know, there's, there's not any guarantee in this life. And so, um, my approach has always been to, um, rather than run from the inevitable, let's try to understand what it might mean and let's try to um, live the life that we have and the time that we have in um, as great a harmony as possible with everything um, that's important to us. You know, if we never think we're going to die, we might make choices that... Um, you know, might kind of hurry that along, so to speak. So um, the reading for this, um, there's a handout in the modules, a PDF. It's a, it's a chapter from a different textbook um, that will help you understand um, more in depth some of the terms that I'm going to go over here in this video. Um, but first, we have to understand what um, mortality actually means. And mortality is simply our eventual decline into death. And when someone close to us dies, and, and I'm sure some of you have experienced this already, um, there are all kinds of different ways that people react and respond to that grief. From, you know, real demonstrative shows of uh, crying and, and wailing and things like that, to anger, to shutting completely down, to um, beginning to engage in, in unhealthy behaviors um, as a way of, of trying to cope and trying to sort of self-medicate. Um, so why, you know, as teenagers, is it important to look at death? And I know all of you are not teenagers, but um, adolescence, which is defined roughly from about age 14 to 25, you know, give or take a couple of years, um, is when people engage in the highest risk-taking behaviors of their lives. Um, everything about the adolescent is about going out into the world, about opening up, about trying new things, about experimenting. All of that is natural, normal part of the adolescent developmental stage. But what it also can do, of course, is um, create less um, foresight or um, also part of the adolescent brain is not 
yet able to really anticipate all of the possible consequences of a choice. Um, so there's that impairment right away. So people will, you know, drive too fast, take risks, you know, spring break, inevitably someone ends up, you know, leaping off a cliff into Lake Pleasant or into something and they hit a rock and they die. Um, you know, these are, these are actions taken by people who aren't able to see the possible ends. So lots of things are going on. This is a, this is a, a very um, chaotic time in our country. We have lots of school shootings. Um, we have shootings of, of all kinds. We have, um, especially in our community, we have um, a great number of treatment and recovery centers. And so um, even though there's a lot of success rate within those centers, there's also, of course, drug-related deaths um, and um you know, sexually transmitted diseases, HIV, AIDS. Um, our parents are um, may die, you know, while we're in adolescence. Um, siblings may die. So I know this is not like, woo, what a fun topic to talk about. But um, when we just sort of persevere through things that are going to happen to us, we're not, we're shutting off a chance to really feel and experience all of life. So death is, is is so bizarre right it's something that every single person undergoes and we can't undo it so um you know everyone may not be a parent but we have all kinds of things we talk about with parenting everyone might not raise children right um everyone might not get married everyone might not um you know even engage in sexual intercourse there's um, so many different ways to live a life but one of the ways is not a life in which there is no death so the study and experience of death and dying, both of ourselves and other people, is called thanatology. Um, and again, like I said earlier, mortality, our eventual decline into death, is a natural part of the life cycle. It doesn't mean that we screwed up. Everything has its moment, everything grows, and then everything dies. It's just part of this you know, planet and the way it works. So um, I'm not saying that we should go home and we should just, you know, turn on, you know, light our candles and sit in the dark and, and do um, nothing but meditate on the end of things. Um, but an awareness of that eventual end, which hopefully for you all will be many, 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 many years into the future, um, helps you make choices today that will inform the kind of life you want to live in a positive way and can help you be in greater and deeper relationship with those around you in the present moment. So this is a really creepy term, terror management theory, right? So TMT. And this theory um, tells us that when we start to think about our own deaths, it really freaks us out. That's essentially what this means. It makes us go, ah, oh my God. Um, because the mind is not very well suited to contemplate its lack of existence. Okay. And because it certainly is normal to fear annihilation, to fear not being here, um, we, we panic and we are like, la, 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 la. I don't hear this conversation. I'm not talking about this. I'm not thinking about this. Um, I'm alive right now. Death is for later. Um, so terror management theory also suggests to us that um, we do have this sort of existential concern, this worry over whether or not the lives that we've lived have been meaningful. And so time and again, time and again, study after study tells us that people who have reached the end of their lives, you know, and so we're, we're speaking with them in, in hospitals, in hospice care, um, you know, on battlefields in, you know, all over the place, um, that the biggest concern is whether or not it mattered that they were here at all. So from my perspective, let's start making choices and let's start doing things that will make it to where you have lived a life that's meaningful to you. And, and that's going to look different for each of us. Um, this conflict in terror management theory um, is that we want to live. That's one side of the coin. But if we're, you know, mature adults, we do understand that death is inevitable and this conflict is essentially unresolvable. 
Um, and at least at this point, it's believed to be a conflict that's unique to humans. We don't have data at this time to suggest that animals are aware um, that they will at some point die. So now um, you might say, well, I watched my cat or I watched my dog or I watched, you know, and as they got sicker or, you know, that they seemed to know what was coming up. Um, in the moment of the body's natural decline into death, that's a different space than, you know, a kitten who's saying, yes, I have a lifespan of approximately 16 to 20 years. Um, I'm going to start, you know, pouncing on things that are going to, you know, give me the most fulfilling cat life possible. Um, that's what we're talking about here. That's awareness from, um, from maturity, essentially, that there will be an end to their lifespan. And right now we don't know. And the key is that we don't know what animals are aware of and not aware of. So mortality salience, um, and if you any of you decide to go into counseling psychology, um, you may get a chance to participate in something like this. If any of you are going into the healthcare fields, if any of you are going to be hospice care nurses or hospice care physicians, this is a really important part of that training. And what this, um, an example of this, and so uh, one of the ways that I worked with this was um, we went to a weekend training and we were given sticky notes and we were given 12 sticky notes um, and then we were given a diagnosis. And so by the end, so this is one big long weekend role play. So by the end of the weekend, we were all going to be dead of whatever our diagnosis was. And the 12 things that we wrote on these sticky notes were the most important things in our lives. So they could be people, pets, activities, um, you know, things you like to do, things, you know, anything at all. They don't have to be just 12 people. Um, the 12 things that matter the most to you about being alive. And then as the weekend progressed and our diagnoses, you know, started to come to fruition, um, we had to take one of these sticky notes and surrender it to the basket. And that was the, the metaphorical representation of losing that thing. So maybe we're losing our ability to um, be mobile. Maybe we're losing our ability to see. Maybe we're losing our ability to walk our dog in the woods. You know, whatever the the thing is. And so you can imagine, you know, lots of lots of emotion comes up in weekends like this. Um, and the training is really important because, you know, even though you know we all got to go home at the end of the weekend, um, it helped first of all build a tremendous amount of empathy for people who are facing um, an, uh, a recent an, or a, a more immediate death. And um, if you want to work with the dying, or even if you want to go into anything in medicine, um, that's always a possibility. So here, um, if we can understand a little bit better what that particular patient is facing in the moment, what's being let go of, because sometimes we can get so focused on how can we fix things, how can we make things better, you know, better, more comfortable, you know, and all that's well and good, but, but death is again, something that's not fixable. So sometimes that paradigm, you know, runs into its own wall. So an activity like this, a mortality salience practice can help us become aware of our own beliefs. Um, it can help us really get clear on what matters to us, um, and what doesn't matter to us. So it can be a good sort of life check-in practice too, you know, is it time to cut this away from my life? Is it time to bring this into my life? You know, questions like that, that, that we move through as we, you know, sort of constantly reevaluate where we are. So it's really important to think about what matters to us while we're here, while we have the energy, while we have the, the healthy bodies, while we have, um, you know, the, the curiosity, you know, I know we're all at different stages, you know, in a class like this, um, everyone is certainly not 18, but um, sometimes we don't take a look at what it is that really makes us go, wow, that just really lights me up. A lot of times, and I think, you know, so I'm almost 50 now, and um, my dad was 19 when I died, when he died, and, um, you know, and I can, I, I can think of three really huge sort of reinventions in my life that I went through, um, where I sort of reevaluated and it's like, all right, this hap this, I'm, I'm on this path. Is this where I want to be? Why do I want to be on this path? What, what else might be out there for me? How can I, you know, adjust and change to allow that in? 
Um, and that's part of being a healthy adult, sort of reflecting on where you are, um, uh, what's working, what isn't, and making any changes applicable to that. But what often happens is we end up sort of just reacting to life, and before we know it, we're 30, 40 years down the road going, oh my God, how did I end up here? Um, so, so in a way to, to kind of help you not become 40, 50, 60 going, oh my God, huh, I didn't really plan this, you know, um, we certainly can't plan everything about a life. There's always things that are going to upend those plans, but we can, um, continue to always refine and focus what it is that lights us up. Um, so like I said in the beginning of the, of the video, um, this is not about morbidly just dwelling on death. Um, it's not about wanting to die before your time. It's not about, you know, delighting in the deaths of others or anything at all like that. It's just about bringing an awareness to the natural part of the life, to this natural part of the life cycle. Um, most people are much more comfortable with birth, you know, with talking about, you know, um, prenatal care and, and, and birthing and birth plans and new babies and, you know, all of that sort of thing, but the end of life is also um, a very powerful transition. So um, that's what we're here to talk about. So kind of along the lines of nobody really talks much about death, um, nobody plans for death either. A, a stunning number of people are not prepared for this inevitability. Most people will have, you know, homeowner's insurance, they'll have, or renter's insurance, they'll have car insurance, health insurance, because we know that something could happen. Um, but our death, which we know will happen, it's like, mm, I don't really want to think about that, so I don't. And the people who suffer when you don't make a plan for your own death are the people that you love. So you can think about um, estate planning, and I know estate is like a big word, and, and um, I was supposed to think of like, you know, castles and manors and moats and alligators and stuff like that. And, and you know, but your estate is just your property, just the things that you have, the things that matter to you. Um, and if fewer than half Americans have a will, that is a lot of people with things left in disarray for the survivors, so for the spouse or for the children or the partner. Um, if you don't um, allocate your wishes in a will, then um, depending on the state you're in, the state can take possession of property. Um, you know, it all varies from state to state, but if you put things down in writing, what you want to have happen and, and who you want to allocate things, pets, resources, intellectual property to, then there's this starting place. Um, so there's something, called, there's the will, which is the, the way that you want your property, your physical assets um, dispersed after your death. A living will, um, which even less than half of Americans have, tells physicians and hospitals what your wishes are if you are unable to make decisions for yourself. So do you want extraordinary measures to save your life? Do you not want extraordinary measures to save your life? Do you want a feeding tube? Do you not want a feeding tube? Do you want, you know, once a hospital goes into motion and starts life support processes, it's very difficult and in many cases illegal for them to turn those things off. If they don't ever put them in, you have greater control over your own body. And so this is a completely, totally personal decision, right? And so at, you know, at 18, you might be like, yeah, I want everything done possible to save my life, right? I'm just starting out. Um, my father was that way in the beginning. Um, he had had polio when he was a, a child, when he was seven years old, and he spent two years in an iron lung um, and lost the use of his right leg um, and was able to you know, sort of persevere from that. And then he got, you know, shot down with this heart attack at 36. And by that point, he had two more heart attacks before the one that killed him in 1987. And um, by that point, um, he had a living will in place. Um, his body was very, uh, was failing. Uh, he was very tired. And he didn't want to go through another kind of resuscitation. He talked about it with all of us. He talked about it with, um, with my mother. 
Um, it's his decision, it's his body, it's what he wanted. Um, but it's a different stage in his life than when he was seven, right? So, and, and you don't have to ever have, you know, one of these, but when you don't have one of these, then the hospitals are going to take the measures to save your life, to keep you alive. Their track is keep the patient alive. So there are a couple of ways that we can plan for a loved one's death. Um, so if someone in your family has a terminal illness, um, and if any of you are, are, are living with someone who has a terminal illness, you understand how much um, energy that takes and how much that illness and that person become the focal point of the family. So it's important to, and, and maybe some of you have read, this was a, a very popular young adult novel a few years ago, the movie came out, um, The Fault in Our Stars, of um, um, oh, a teenager, a teenage girl with cancer. And, um, and I thought it was a really great novel because it brought um, a real sense of honesty to the conversation about death and not just about the person dying, but about what's going to happen, what kind of lives are going to be there for the people who are, who are continuing on. Um, so we have two primary types, a cognitive rehearsal and a behavioral rehearsal. Cognitive rehearsal, so think cognitive, think thoughts. Cognitive allows us to imagine, so it's sort of like we're in our, we're in our minds and we're um, trying to conceptualize what life is going to be like once this person has died. Um, behavioral rehearsal, so action, things that we do, our behaviors, um, what plans need to be put in place for the future. Um, do we want to stay in the same city? Do we want to move? Do we want um, a different career? Do we want to take, you know, or are we able to take a year off or two years off or something? You know, that's not certainly possible for many people. But what, what might you do after the person passes as well? And this can help um, give you a little bit of, of a sense of control in a time when there often feels like there's no control. So the living will, like I discussed, is this document in which an individual expresses his or her wishes as to the course of personal medical care should that person no longer be able to express him or herself. Okay. So this gives your family something to lean on. Oh, this is what he or she wanted. Um, and that can be, I can't stress enough how helpful that can be because there's so many emotions in the moment that a tragedy strikes. Um, that it's very difficult to make clear decisions. So, some different um, definitions for death. You'd think death would be death, but it isn't. Um, clinical death is when your body actually dies. Okay, so the blood is no longer circulating and you can't breathe on your own. And that's a key phrase, on your own. That's clinical death. Legal death is when a physician declares that person dead. So sometimes these are the same time if a, if a person dies in the hospital or on the operating table, um, but often it's not exactly the same time. Say um, a person died in their home, they weren't found for a day or two, the physician or the coroner estimates a time of death that would be the legal death that gets put on the death certificate. So because psychology likes nothing better than to categorize things, we've also categorized lots of different kinds of losses um, because the different kinds of losses can have different impacts on um, people's uh, coping strategies. So sudden loss is exactly what it sounds like. Um, the death occurs with absolutely no um, warning. So it could be a sudden heart attack, um, it could be a fall, it could be a car accident. Um, um, expected loss is when we know that it's coming. Okay, We know the death is coming. So these two terms sound like what they are. Um, and so the example here is a terminal illness. Um, your grandpa gets a, a diagnosis of cancer. Um, you understand that he's got, you know, 12 to 18 months left, according to best guesses. Um, so we begin to, to start to consider what that transition is going to be like. The ways that we care for the dying are as varied as there are people. 
Um, but there are two primary ways I want you to understand. And the first is palliative care. And palliative care is about pain alleviation. It's about um, providing medicine, providing treatments um, with the sole goal of minimizing pain. So palliative care can be provided to people who are not necessarily dying. Okay, So palliative care, pain alleviation. Hospice care um, is only for, and this is, this is a key difference, is only for the terminally ill. Um, generally, you have to have a six-month diagnosis from a doctor because hospice care is covered by uh, Medicare and most insurance plans. So there has to be that legal, you know, that legal diagnosis from a doctor. And you can come and go, though. Sometimes people come and go in hospices for several years. Um, average stay in hospice is six to eight weeks. Hospice care is concerned with pain management, so it's not about letting you suffer. Um, but it also treats um, psychological uh, concerns. So there are ways of, um, you know, there's always a, a volunteer. Um, I did a lot of volunteer work for hospice down in the valley, down in Phoenix, a little bit up here in Prescott. Um, it helps, um, volunteers will uh, sit with the, the play, with the patients, they'll sit with the family. Hospice care is also about providing support for the caregivers. So um, they'll come to your house if your loved one is at home. Uh, so that you can go, you know, just go to the grocery store in peace, or you can go see a movie or go take a walk. Okay? They provide a whole lot of different services. So you'll see a, a short list at the bottom of the slide. Nursing care, physical care, medication management, psychosocial care, and caregiver support. One thing hospice will not do is resuscitate. Um, so hospice is not, um, if you're in hospice care, they're going to allow the dying to occur. They're not going to uh, force feed you. Um, they're not going to pump, you know, force fluids into you. They're not going to put you on a respirator to keep your lungs working. Um, it's an understanding. Everyone that, that, that goes to hospice and everyone that works with hospice, the understanding is to create a space that's as comfortable as possible for the natural um, act of dying to occur. So you may have heard of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Um, it's 1969. Her first book came out on death and dying. Um, and it really shook things up in the field. She was the first uh, psychiatrist to really give um, any sort of credence to this dying process. Um, there are criticisms to her, to her theory like there are to every theory. Um, but she really, really opened the door to this conversation about, about death. Um, her stages of dying have often gotten transposed and thought of as stages of grief. And whereas there's certainly overlap, they're not the same thing. And it's important to know that Kubler-Ross studied people who were dying. She did not study, at least in, at least in this book, she did not study the impact of a dying person on a survivor. So these were the five stages. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Um, and if you watch the little video with the giraffe, um, it'll give you sort of a hilarious and uh, slightly vulgar interpretation of these stages. Um, one of the, the biggest challenges here is that, of course, no one does experience dying the same way. And whenever things get put in a list, People seem to think they need to check things off the list in the order in which they appear on the list. So um, denial has to happen first, anger has to happen second, um, etc. Whereas in reality, these more sort of uh, blend into one another. Um, there is a fairly common response to a terminal diagnosis of, uh-uh, not me. Um, and then when people start to accept that maybe it is happening, they get angry. Then they try to negotiate ways around it. Then as the acceptance starts to sink in, um, they may experience depression and then an acceptance. Um, everyone does not experience all these five stages. Um, certainly everyone does not reach an acceptance of any sort 
um, but some people certainly do. Um, but it's important to know what these five stages are and that they really opened up the door to a conversation about grief. Um, she broke th this huge taboo about death. Um, so let's talk about some terms. Um, and these are easily confused terms because they certainly seem to be all about the same thing. So bereavement is the state of reality associated with a loss. Okay, so you can think, so bereavement is a noun. You can think of it like a house, um, a, a place. So the example here, conjugal bereavement refers to someone who has lost a spouse. Um, so someone who is experiencing conjugal bereavement, the place of the reality associated with that particular loss is um, bereaved, is considered to be bereaved. Grief is an internal reaction to death. So it's our emotional reactions to death. Mourning is how we externalize, how we behaviorally show and express that grief. Um, so grief is internal, what's going on inside of you. Mourning is how you present that grief to the outside world. So lots of different forms of grief as well. Um, disenfranchised grief. Um, this is when our particular society does not recognize that loss. It's a grief not validated by society. So for quite a long time, um, uh, people who were in same-sex relationships, um, when their partner died, they were not allowed to even be, you know, in the hospital. And with that person, in many cases, the family of the deceased wanted, um, you know, nothing to do with that person who might have been a partner, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. Okay, so fortunately that has changed a great deal in the last decade and, um, and homosexual relationships have been given equal credence, equal status under the law. But um, another example, a more silly example might be, um, you know, the, the, the death of a, of, a, of a hamster or, you know, something that, that people might consider to be like a less than sort of pet. Um, anticipatory grief is the reaction that occurs before an impending loss. You can think about this, it's right in the word anticipatory. Um, it's planning. So you're sort of, I'm gonna try to get all my grief feelings out before the death actually occurs so that I'll be maybe better prepared to take on what's gonna happen next. Um, uh, parents experience this a great deal. Um, uh, you know, the oldest child, perhaps, if a parent is dying, whoever seems to be the one for whom the most caregiving burden has fallen will experience, will tend to experience a lot more anticipatory grief because they feel so much like they have to always have everything um, held together for everybody else. So they'll try to get their grief reactions out in the, in the privacy of their own rooms, basically. Um, Broken heart syndrome um, is uh, a suggestion that widows or widowers um, are at greater risk of serious illness or even death following their spouse's death. Um, so what that essentially means is that if your spouse dies, you, according to the broken heart syndrome, are more likely to die within a year or two after that spouse's death. Um, some of the things that can happen when a spouse dies, especially in... in in really long-term relationships. Um, a lot of times people become each other's own social support system. And when that individual dies, um, that person is, the person left is socially isolated. Um, as of course we age, more and more of our peers die. And so there's that isolation that occurs just with getting old in our society. Um, but not having a social network um, there's a strong correlation between not having a strong social network and um, an early death after the loss of a spouse. Um, men and women grieve differently. And okay? just like, you know, we do all sorts of things differently. Um, and these are stereotyped differences, but they, they do seem to, um, to sort of follow, follow suit into, the, into our culture. Um, men tend to, so understand that word tend to, men tend to want to fix things and do things. 
Um, the male stereotyped attribute is toward action. Um, and so when faced with grieving, um, men are often, they often feel quite helpless because there's nothing that they actually can do to fix things. But they'll, they may, you know, start building things, painting rooms, um, trying to, to understand and cognitively fix things. Um, women tend to be more emotional and tend to be more expressive of those emotions, um, stereotyped attributes, of course. Um, but women also tend to, again, stereotyped attribute, tend to have a stronger social network than men. And that social network can help in times of grief. Um, again, look at those as generalizations, um, not as um, if you're a man, this is what you do. If you're a woman, this is how you do. Um, it's, it's not anywhere near that black and white. Um, something really fascinating about grief is its cumulative nature. And this means that um, if we don't allow ourselves to express grief as it occurs, um, we're going to end up putting it, stuffing it, you may have heard that term, stuffing it somewhere in our bodies. And at some point, that grief is going to come out. At some point, that grief reaction is going to explode. So you may have heard the cliche, you know, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, and it was just this little thing that sort of set off this, this reaction that was out of whack with the trigger. That's what is going on. So um, people who've experienced a great deal of grief in their life and have not processed that grief um, are at greater risk of uh, heart disease, high blood pressure, um, other stress-related illnesses, um, because those emotions remain unexpressed. Now, this does not mean that you have to go to a therapist to process your grief and sit around in a circle and sing kumbaya or anything like that. It just is. A, it just means that it's important to understand um, and allow those natural feelings to sort of run the gamut in a safe way. Um, so if you think about a baby um, who has very limited ways of expressing him or herself, right? They can cry, they can throw up on you, they can poop, you know, there's not a lot that they can do. But when they feel something, when they want something, when they're hungry, they'll cry when they're, if they're cold, if they're hot, if they get hurt, you know, they'll express this feeling. And then when that feeling gets acknowledged, they'll stop. Okay, so that's what infants are born knowing that they have to move that feeling. And then there's no point in continuing to express the feeling once it's been, you know, expressed and, and you've gotten your bottle or you've gotten your diaper changed or whatever is, is happening because it's over. You didn't need, you don't need to carry that feeling any farther. But as we grow older and in our general, you know, sort of death phobic culture, um, we don't have a lot of avenues to continue to express grief um, in healthy ways. So we, we tend to not express that grief, and it just builds and builds and builds. There's some, uh, some new really cool things going on around the country. Um, one of them is called, um, they're called death cafes. And I know that also probably sounds like, yay, you know what I want to do tonight? I want to go to a death cafe. But our um, amazing local bookstore, Peregrine Book Company, um, down on Cortez and Sheldon, um, hosts Death Cafe on uh, once a month. I think it's on a Thursday night. I'm not sure. Um, and Death Cafes are places, um, and these are packed. These are really um, popular things because there isn't, there aren't many places to go to talk about death. Um, it's not a religious thing. It's not therapy. It's just a place to have conversations. Um, and it's proven to, to really be, be popular across the country. So we'll stop here after part one, and I will um, pick up here with part two.